So a couple of weeks ago, I was giving another speech, go figure, uh, to a group of Okinawan middle school students where I was asked to describe my work. And I am a material scientist and engineer by trade with a background in nanotechnology. And so the question arose, what is a nanometer? The textbook definition of a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. But then that got me to thinking, does anyone really know what a billionth of a meter is? And that kind of took me down a line of thinking of just how ill-equipped the human mind is at comprehending quantities that are very large and very small. Now, comprehending quantities that are very large and very small are, is very important to science because, in essence, science is all about the quantification and qualification of things in the world around us, right? And you watch these documentaries sometime, and in these documentaries, they'll talk about how the universe is 14 billion years old or how the universe may be comprised of strings that are 10 to the minus 35th of a meter. But to be honest, I don't think anyone, the narrator, myself, or the, audi or the intended audience can actually comprehend these scales to actually intuit what these numbers mean. In the words of Richard Dawkins, our brains have evolved to help us survive within the orders of magnitude, of size and speed at which our bodies operate at. And this talk is an attempt, just an attempt, to penetrate these veils of vastness, smallness, and innumerability of the world around us. So the first thing I came across in preparing for this talk was that human beings are terrible at counting. All of us, and I do mean all of us, can't really count beyond eight. Now, before everybody gets up in arms about their fancy college education, I need to clarify what I mean by counting. Counting here, I mean, what I mean by counting here is subitization. A term coined in 1949 by an American psychologist by the name of E.L. Kaufman, subitization is our gut feeling for numbers, our ability to look at a certain amount of something, of identical objects, and immediately say, oh, there's three or four of this on the table. And it turns out that beyond eight, your mileage will definitely vary. But let's look at why. I'd like to ask the audience to do a bit of a thought experiment with me here. So I'd like you all to imagine a single elephant with majestic tusks and trunk and all. Even if you haven't been to the zoo, you can probably imagine what an elephant looks like. Next, I'd like to ask the audience to find their elephant a nice date. So now you have two elephants. Still within the realm of possibility. How about three elephants? Doable. Four elephants? Yeah, you could do that. Five elephants? Uh. So what's happening here? Chances are you've started putting your elephants in recognizable shapes. Triangles, or rows, or, or crosses, or squares, or what have you. And this is a neat thing that the brain does called visual grouping. Studied in the 1930s and 1940s by a, group, by a school of psychology called Gestalt Psychology in Germany, this school found that even babies were capable of discerning and identifying small abstract numbers. They were able to identify that three of something was more than two of something. But in that same vein, as the number increases, or as the, or as the adage goes, as above, so below, if the fraction decreases, it becomes more difficult for us to subitize. So a hundred elephants, a thousand elephants, not as easy to actually imagine. As one cognitive scientist called Douglas Halfstetter put it, we have a sense of number numbness for very large and very small quantities. So that's one thing that's getting in the way of our perception of very large and very small quantities. Another thing that's also getting in the way is how we define numbers, because how we define numbers inadvertently ends up affecting how we perceive them. There are two kinds of numbers. The first is cardinal numbers, and that is the numbers, those are the numbers that we use for counting on a day-to-day -day basis, the number of things. So for example, the number of unnecessary sequels or prequels or reboots or spin-offs in your favorite movie franchise. Seriously, Hollywood, enough. On the other hand, there are also ordinal numbers, and ordinal numbers are the numbers in a sequence, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth item on a list. Now this is very 
very important because scientific notation, which is by far the most common means of representing human numbers, is involved with juggling cardinal and ordinal quantities. So for example, instead of saying 10,000, you can say 10 to the fourth power, right? Or instead of saying 1,000, you can say 10 to the third power. Scientific notation is a strong but double-edged weapon in our representation of large quantities. It allows us to make immediate assertions that 6 million of something is less than 7 million of something. But on the other hand, it does nothing for us. If you put 6 million grains of sand on the ground right now, and I immediately ask you, how many grains of sand are there? You can't, do, you can't count that. You can't subitize that. The notation is only good for representing the numbers, not for intuiting them, right? And at the core of this, at the core of scientific notation, is this idea of exponentiation, this idea of multiplying or dividing a number by itself a certain number of times, right? And we deal with exponentiation all the time with denominations of money. When we say the number of dimes in a dollar or the number of $10 bills in a hundred, right? So manipulating numbers, having to go back and forth and basically compare quantities is something that is happening in different regions of the brain. When we try and when I ask you to do a long division problem, it turns out that functional MRI studies show us that it's the left hemisphere, portions of the left hemisphere of your brain that are lighting up like a Christmas tree doing this operation. On the other hand, when I hold up three fingers and I hold up four fingers and I ask you which one of these is bigger, it's actually both hemispheres of your brain that are involved in comparing numbers. Long story short, as far as your brain is concerned, doing math and comparing quantities are two completely different things. So that can get in the way of your understanding of what large numbers are or what small numbers are. To put this in perspective, a million dollars could fit in a suitcase. A billion dollars would require a large pickup truck to transport, whereas a trillion dollars would be a football field as high as the average adult male. Now, orders of magnitude are ordinal, right? The orders of magnitude themselves, for example, the third power, the fourth power, the minus third power, are ordinal, but they increase arithmetically. They are linear. So third, fourth, fifth, and so on. However, the quantities that they represent, the cardinal numbers that they represent, are increasing exponentially. We're multiplying again the number again by itself. So each number, for example, in the thousandfold uh, common usage of numbers of millions, billions, and trillions, is a thousandfold of the preceding number. So numbers can quickly blow much larger than we can understand them. One last thing to also consider as to why numbers are so difficult to comp large and small numbers are so difficult to comprehend is their novelty. In 1939, a mathematician by the name of Edward Kaysner challenged his nine-year-old nephew to come up with an inconceivably large number. His nephew Milton, industrious fellow that he was, decided to take a piece of paper, write down one, and follow it with a hundred zeros. He called this number a Google. Now, a Google truly is large, so large, in fact, that it might be larger than the total number of atoms in the observable universe, which scientists guesstimate at 10 to the 81st power. Simply speaking, before very recent times, we simply did not have neither the computational power nor the resolving power to actually observe numbers that were very large or very small of anything. Avogadro's number, which you may remember from your high school chemistry class as the number of species, be they atoms, ions, or atoms, in a gram mole of substance, is something that is very recent. It was only discovered in 1909, which is a blink of an eye in, the hu in, the human, in human history, right? Another thing to consider is that, for example, looking very far away, with, say, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Hubble was launched in living memory. It was launched in 1990. And even just last year, in 2016, they discovered yet another distant galaxy and broke the cosmic distance record. So seeing things that are this far is still something that is ongoing. In closing, there's an ongoing debate in pedagogy, developmental psychology, and cognitive neuroscience about why it is so difficult 
for human beings to comprehend very large and very small quantities. And to be frank, I think that nothing short of a sci-fi-esque cybernetic upgrade would allow a person to just look at a pile of sand and say, oh yeah, of course, there's 53,237,499 grains in this pile. But the takeaway here isn't how to perceive these large quantities, it's what's getting in the way in the hope that this awareness will help the, pedagog the pedagogical community in conveying large and small quantities. So, first of all, just to summarize, cognition, this sense of number numbness that gets in the way, and the lateralization of brain function, where doing operations and comparing quantities occupies different regions of the mind. Second, convention and the scientific notation and how it can be a double-edged weapon. And finally, novelty in perceiving and quantifying very large and very small quantities. Thank you.